On the 7th of March, 2023, all contact was lost with the RV Boreas, an Arctic research vessel sent up north from the coast of Svalbard only two months prior. It had been tasked with prospecting newly discovered rock formations 50 nautical miles from the settlement of Nee Olsen, but had gone dark about two weeks into its mission. A recovery team was sent to assess the situation. As they boarded the deck, they reported no sign of the vessel's original crew. And though they didn't discover any damage to the ship itself, each and every lifeboat had been apparently sabotaged, preventing any crew from escaping. As the recovery team delved deeper into the bowels of the ship, they quickly realized that something was terribly wrong. The reports were unclear about what exactly happened. The initial team reported finding strange biological matter that appeared to react to their presence. But before they could accurately describe their findings, the transmission was cut short by the sound of screaming, followed by radio silence. Both the vessel's original crew and the initial recovery team were reported dead, with a second operation on the way. Though unclear what to expect once on board, the secondary team was equipped with heavy weaponry and explosives to take down the RV Boreas should the mission prove unsuccessful. Dr. Teague, a man half asked, half stated as he approached me on deck. Figures they'd send a scientist on a dangerous recovery mission, he continued sarcastically. Did they tell you what happened to the last guys they sent over there? I nodded and responded with as little emotion as I could muster. That they're dead? Right, he responded, almost surprised by my blunt answer. The man before me was Dale Jackson, the leader of our recovery operation. He was a battle-hardened man who'd taken part in many hostage situations at sea. Though he had a set team he always worked with, High Command had deemed it necessary to send a biologist along to assess the possibility of an unknown pathogen rummaging around on the RV Boreas. Even with that in mind, Jackson didn't take kindly to the presence of a newcomer, one not familiar with his strategies. They tell me you have combat experience? Again, asking a question he already knew the answer to. I was a medic. Yeah, so I've heard. But I know why High Command sent you along for the fight, and it ain't to patch up cuts and bruises, he stated, taking a step closer as if attempting to intimidate me. He was right, and he knew it. I had been sent along solely to extract whatever biological matter that was discovered by the original recovery team. They suspected foul play, or the possibility of a new kind of biological warfare, which had killed the entire crew aboard the vessel. Because of that, the people in charge wanted to know exactly what they were dealing with. These people, Jackson began, their lives are infinitely more important than whatever shit your bosses want you to bring back. You do what you gotta do but I don't want any distractions. You got that? I nodded. As tiresome as the harsh facade might get, I could fathom how much he cared for his team. They were people he served with for years, and the thought of losing them was an idea he couldn't readily accept. Then we're gonna get along just fine, he announced, cracking a forced smile. <laughs> we'll make sure you stay long enough to return to your labs back on shore. With that final quip, he headed back down inside, glancing back with one last piece of friendly advice. Better get suited up, Doc. We're about to head out. Six of us would dress up in military-grade hazmat suits to board the ship. Each of the team would wield rifles to take down any possible threat on board, while I'd be wielding a pistol purely for self-defense. In that sense, I had taken the part of a non-combatant, only taking part in fights as a matter of last resort. As I returned my gaze to the foggy horizons in the distance, I was interrupted by another one of the team members. He likes to assert dominance, a woman explained as she approached me. You're the doctor, right? I nodded, noticing her friendlier demeanor. Figures, I saw the chopper arrive half an hour ago. Yeah, they picked me up from Svalbard, I answered. You must be a real VIP to get that kind of service, she joked handing me an honest handshake to welcome me on board. I'm Marion Guerra, she said. Let me show you where to get suited up. And if you're up for it, I'll introduce you to the rest of the team. Thanks, I'm Liam, by the way, I responded. She led me inside the freighter, down towards a prepping area at the end of a long corridor. There, 
we could find showers, a locked up armory, and a large closet full of hazmat suits. Three men were getting dressed inside, mostly young, but experienced fighters. Only one of them acknowledged my presence, introducing himself as Kyle Connolly, the mission's engineer. The assholes are Cameron and Burns, Marion explained in a joking manner. They like to pretend that they're real badasses, but in reality, they're just trying to get daddy's approval. Burns hesitantly shook my hand, while Cameron remained dead set on ignoring my existence. Better get ready, Burns said coldly. We're about to head out. I kept quiet as we suited up, listening to the rest of the team banter with each other. Marion and Connolly seemed like the most receptive of the bunch, still carrying a tinge of optimism in their voices. A stark contrast to the worry evident with the rest of the crew. I could only imagine what horrors Cameron and Burns had witnessed under Jackson's leadership to take away their shine. Once we covered ourselves in protective gear, Sergeant Jackson joined us in the changing rooms, already wielding his rifle. He took a moment to explain the exact route we'd be taking once on board the RV Boreas. We'd start by clearing the deck before heading directly to the bridge to retrieve the ship's voyage data recorder, more colloquially called a black box. Unlike the rest of the crew, and as a non-combatant, I only brandished a pistol, needing one free hand to carry a briefcase filled with scientific equipment anyway. Cameron scoffed, mumbling something about priorities and dedication. Marion gave his shoulder a gentle punch, telling him to shut his mouth. Now listen, Jackson began. We've been scouting out the ship for a week, and there ain't no signs of life to be found on board. As far as we know, they're all deceased. We're not on a rescue mission, and we're not expecting a fight. That being said, if anyone takes any risks, you better be sure I'm gonna personally kick your ass back to the mainland. Stick to the plan. Follow my damn orders. We walked up onto the deck. Ice cold wind brushed against us as we waited for the dinghies to be prepared. The RV Boreas was located 10 clicks north of our position, having drifted towards a glacier surrounded by heavy flakes of drift ice. We weren't able to fit one large boat through the narrow passages, which meant we'd be traversing the rest of the distance in two separate dinghies. The RV Boreas should have been easily visible, but with thick fog forming on the ocean, we could barely see five feet ahead of us. Under normal circumstances, I'd expect the mission to be postponed, but High Command had deemed it urgent. I don't like this, Burns muttered to himself. What was that? I asked, not expecting a reply. This doesn't feel like a normal recovery operation. If the crew is dead, why are we in such a hurry to check on them? He had a point, but my thoughts were preoccupied with the question of what exactly had killed the crew. Not knowing how to respond, I could only shrug half-heartedly. Not caring for my reaction, Burns then turned to me, staring at me with distrust in his eyes. Why are you here? He asked. As I already said, I'm here to investigate the biological substance they found on the RV Boreas, I exclaimed calmly. But why would they send you in with us? Why not let us secure the ship first? What's with the fucking urgency? They were all questions, ones I hadn't even thought to ask myself. I assumed with my combat experience, I could actually aid the team if need be. But Burns had made two good points in quick succession, which made me respect the man a bit more. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to go, Jackson announced, cutting short any time we had to contemplate the true purpose of our job. We descended down to the dinghies and set off into the fog, far away from the safety of our freighter. With the motors carrying us away at a quick pace, it didn't take more than a minute before we'd be entirely swallowed by the thick fog, leaving us alone in an empty, white void, drifting on the icy waters of the Arctic. You sure we can navigate this shit? Cameron asked. Not even close, but at least we know where the vessel is supposed to be. The transponder is still active. Jackson shot back. For almost an hour, we carefully navigated the ice, which was itself barely visible in the fog. It was a silent journey. Apart from the sound of our whirring propeller, there were no sign of life anywhere around us. We didn't speak much during the ride either, apart from a few curse words thrown around as we accidentally drove into smaller ice fragments that bumped into our ride. But as our frustration had reached a high point, something finally appeared amidst the fog. 
I got eyes on the ship! Connolly yelled out as he pointed towards the massive silhouette of the RV Boreas drifting through the ice. Masks on everyone! We don't know what kind of toxins are floating around up there. Get ready to board the ship! Jackson ordered. Extendable ladders were quickly mounted to the side of the ship, allowing us to silently board the vessel, two at a time. Marion and Burns took the lead, swiftly ascending up onto deck. The rest of us followed shortly after. We had entered on the starboard side of the ship and immediately laid eyes upon the sabotaged lifeboats. Even with my inadequate experience, I could tell the damage had been deliberate. The two leading the charge scanned their surroundings, signaling that the coast was clear. Sure enough, as we traversed the entire surface of the deck, there was no sign of life to be found, nor were there any hints at a struggle that might have taken place. Whatever answers we could find aboard the ship, we'd have to delve deeper inside its interior. While I took a brief moment to peer into the fog, Sergeant Jackson ordered the team to move to the bridge. The fog had already grown thicker since we sat foot on the RV Boreas, blinding out any view of the world outside. We couldn't even see the waters below, isolated on a boat with uncertain dangers lurking below deck. Jackson took the lead and guided us up several flights of stairs that inevitably led to the top of the ship, which held the vessel's modern bridge. Like the deck below, it had been rid of all life, leaving behind inactive control panels and inactive monitors. Controls are busted, Connolly muttered as he fiddled with the buttons. Power has been cut too. Looks like the backup generator is the only thing keeping this ship running. Can you access the VDR? Jackson asked. The device itself was situated on the outside of the bridge, encapsulated in a bright orange flotation device. Should the ship sink, the VDR would detach and remain floating on the ocean's surface until rescuers could retrieve it. But since the RV Boreas was still semi-operational, we could easily access its data through the bridge with extra information to spare. Among the data were audio logs, numbered and categorized for our convenience. We went back to the days before the crew lost contact to get an insight into what had caused their sudden disappearance and subsequent demise. We played our first highlighted log dated the 26th of February, 2023. Upon starting the clip, we were met by a scruffy sounding voice. Captain Eloise Haynes, log number 404. Our mission was on the brink of total failure. After a couple of weeks at sea with nothing to report back with, we finally discovered something worth our paychecks. A monolith of black ice, sitting deep within the ocean at the base of a newly discovered rock formation. It's made of an unknown substance, denser than liquid water. We brought it on board and isolated it in the laboratory, taking every precaution to avoid contact with possible pathogens in the ice, following the advice of our all too precautious doctor. Preliminary findings should be available within the next three days. We just might have saved our jobs. Happy birthday, Boreas. May you sail the high seas for many more years to come. Without wasting time, we went on to the next highlighted log, dated the 2nd of March, 2023. The monolith doesn't seem responsive to temperature. We first assumed the thing to be made from water mixed with an unfamiliar substance to keep its crystal in formation. But what we presumed to be ice turned out to be biological remnants from a bygone era. Sharp enough to cut through metal, but soft to the touch. Our cautious Dr. Barrett managed to cut himself on its surface, just barely touching it with protective gloves. Though he appears in good spirits, without any signs of disease, the wound just won't stop bleeding. We've isolated him in the sick bay until we can rule out an infectious pathogen. Following his own instructions, might I add, all testing on the monolith has been halted until further notice. The third highlighted log was dated two days later, on the 4th of March, 2023. After two days in isolation, we were left with no choice but to amputate Dr. Barrett's wounded hand. With the bleeding showing no sign of stopping, and strange black marks appearing on his hand, it was clear that the cut had infected the poor man with something unknown to modern medicine. Though we don't have any proper medical doctors on board, the man begged us to do it, worried the disease might spread unless we removed his limb. Following the amputation, we thought the infection had been stopped, but mere hours later, further black marks appeared up his right arm as well as his shoulder and torso. The affected skin appears alive, yet it is not sensitive to pain nor touch, as if the nerve endings have stopped functioning. Dr. Barrett has coined the infection, acute skin wasting disease, and he intends on making his 
progression through the different stages, even if it leads to his own demise. We've attempted to make contact with the mainland, but we've been experiencing issues with our communications array. We're heading back to Svalbard, but through the solid ice, our progress has greatly slowed. It might be days before we even get through the flash ice. Only one highlighted recording remained before the standard, non-specific audio logs. It was dated the 6th of March, 2023, only one day before the last transmission was ever sent from the RV Boreas. Without an introduction, we were met by a frantic sounding captain, barely audible over arguments and fighting in the background. More than half the crew have been isolated within the medical bay in wake of the outbreak of acute skin wasting disease. It started with the assistant who amputated Dr. Barrett's arm despite having no skin to skin contact with the patient himself. It's unknown how the pathogen broke through the suit's protection, but by the time we realized he had fallen ill, it was too late. Those still remaining are working hard to repair the damage to the ship, though it's still unknown who and what caused it. We're suspecting foul play without any suspects in custody. The monolith remains safely secured in Lab B. We've left clear instructions to destroy it in the event that our vessel is discovered absent surviving crew, but we lack the means to do so ourselves. The best solution might be to destroy the entire ship. But the way things are looking, if the disease does not kill us, I suspect we might kill each other. Following the last direct message from the captain, the remaining recordings were simple calls for help from whatever crew struggled to futilely remain alive. But none of the attempts were successful, leaving the poor men and women to die at the hands of a so far unseen enemy. Based on the little we knew, it wasn't an enemy susceptible to firepower and strategy alone. We stood in silence as we tried to decipher the meaning of the messages, extracting the little meaning they provided. But none of us had the faintest idea what we were up against. What the fuck was that? Cameron finally asked, shattering the uncomfortable silence. An infection? Marion chimed in. With the mention of a possible pathogen, the team turned to me with questioning eyes. Did you know about this? Burns asked. Taking a step back, I shook my head in a mixture of disbelief and annoyance. You think I'd volunteer if I knew the entire crew was killed by a foreign pathogen that might penetrate protective gear? I don't know anything more than you do. I was sent here because of the biological matter described by the first rescue team. I've never heard of an infection or monolith of black ice. So, are we dealing with some kind of plague? Is that what we just heard the captain describe? Jackson asked. I'm honestly not sure. Sounds like an infectious pathogen. But if what we heard is accurate, it's unlike anything I've ever encountered before. In fact, it's unlike anything ever encountered by mankind. Another moment of silence fell over us. None of us were sure how to handle the situation according to the newfound information. If the crew had died of an infection, did it warrant an armed crew of Marines? We should check out the laboratories, Burns suggested. Are you insane? What are we going to do against an infection? Shoot at the bacteria and hope they don't fight back? Cameron snapped at him. We're wearing hazmat suits for just that purpose, Marion replied. These things will keep us safe, right, Liam? I mumbled something about how the suits were supposed to function, but in the end, I could only let out a feeble. Yes. Well, that settles it, Jackson decided. We're here to find out what happened to the crew. If HC wants answers, I suggest we follow the plan and proceed to the labs. None of you have to touch the icy rock of death. You just have to prove it exists. Not deterred by the possibility of an infection and not truly understanding the gravity of the dead crew's discovery, we started our descent into the bowels of the ship. Our first stop would be the medical bay, situated inside at deck level. Though we hardly expected to find survivors still locked up inside, we had to rule out the possibility that someone had survived the ordeal. Dim lights powered by the backup generator illuminated the metallic hallways, supported by bright flashlights mounted onto our suits. Each step taken produced an eerie echo that vibrated through the floor. Several doors lined the hallway, each repurposed for isolation of the infected crew, with small windows allowing us to peer inside without risking exposure to the pathogen. Each room had been equipped with basic medical equipment, a bed and some trays, but they were all vacant. Strange black patches lined the walls and furniture. From a distance, it resembled mold, but without a sample, we couldn't be sure. 
In the end, we didn't bother opening them, already able to ascertain that they contained no survivors. Only once we reached the end of the corridor did we find a windowless room marked Infirmary. Keeping his mouth shut, Jackson gestured for Marion and Burns to get inside and clear the place. Without hesitation, they both barged in with their rifles raised, ready to take down any possible hostiles, be it crew members or otherwise. We stumbled in behind them, met with a dark room just barely illuminated by our flashlights. It felt as if the walls themselves, covered by more of the black, mold-like substance, absorbed the light. We quickly scanned through the room, not finding any signs of movement. Multiple hospital beds stood lining the wall, each dirty, covered with the strange, dark mass we couldn't readily identify. Burns approached one of the beds, poking the mass with the barrel of his rifle. It was soft, seemingly organic in nature, and it broke apart easily by even a gentle touch. Jackson pulled Burns back, forcefully raising his rifle. Who taught you how to handle one of these? He said, annoyed. You did, Sarge. Burns responded. If I taught you to poke random shit with the barrel of your rifle, they better fire me. Keep your weapon clean, he ordered. Right. Sorry, Burns let out meekly. What is this stuff, though? Cameron asked. None of us possessed the insight to answer that seemingly simple question. What lay before us was a bizarre, biological formation unlike anything I'd ever seen. We walked from bed to bed, trying to comprehend the mess left behind. It wasn't until Connolly let out a faint gasp before we all snapped back to attention. Sergeant, I found something. I think it's... The words got stuck in his throat. Cameron took to guarding the exit, while the rest of us gathered around what appeared to be a pitch black, humanoid figure lying with its back towards us in one of the corners. With the substance patched across the wall, the individual had appeared almost invisible. Is that one of the crew members? Marion asked. Though holding the shape of a human, I wasn't entirely sure it was one. It was covered in the same black substance as the rest of the room. I bent down to investigate, barely daring to touch it, even with all the layers of protection I was wearing. I turned it over to face us, only to be met with an empty face and a gaping hole in its chest and abdominal cavity. I realized then that one of the arms was missing. If it had once been human, it sure didn't have many recognizable qualities left to inspect. What the hell happened to it? Burns asked. It? Jackson asked. You suggesting that ain't human? I don't know what it is, but that sure as hell doesn't look right. He responded, gesturing to the gaping hole in the torso. But besides the clearly visible damage done to the poor thing, something else about its appearance unnerved me. Something not instantly obvious to those without medical training. The innards were disfigured in an almost impossible manner, as if the anatomical structures within had been reorganized in a new but pointless manner. I shined my flashlight closer, getting a better view of the insides. There, I noticed what looked like a seamless surgical rearrangement of vessels, intestines, and other organs. Specks of the black substance lined the intestinal tract, which had been inserted into the right lung. The aorta had been removed entirely, replaced with a sac-like formation extending out from the heart. Knowing I'd found what High Command wanted me to investigate, I opened my briefcase and used a scalpel to extract a sample from the deceased subject. So, this is what you came for? Burns asked, malice clearly audible in his voice. To pick apart dead bodies? No, but if you want any hope of understanding what's going on, you'll keep your mouth shut keep an eye out for any danger around us. It was my first outburst against the group, but with the bizarreness of everything going on around us, I couldn't hold it in anymore. The hostility from certain team members was getting to me. In the end, Burns seemed to take the hint and didn't push the matter any further. Once I finished sealing the sample within a testing tube, I noticed something stuck to the deceased's remaining hand, a notebook still not covered in the substance. I opened to the first page, to be greeted by doctor's notes and a name. Dr. Ewan Barrett, it read. I guess we found patient zero. I mumbled as I held the book up to the rest of the team. Bring the book. We'll have time to skim through it later. But now, it's time to move. We're heading for the lab next. Let's get going. Cameron, take point, Jackson ordered. 
we entered the ship's stairwell, proceeding deeper into the unknown. We went exactly one floor down, moving into another dimly lit corridor. On edge, we proceeded with care, only to immediately realize that we ended up in the wrong place. Where are the labs? Marion asked. They're supposed to be here, Cameron said. The blueprints said the labs were right beneath the infirmary. But instead of the laboratory, we were met with what looked like living quarters. Rooms lined each side, their doors listing numbers and names. We walked down the hall, attempting to open a few of them, but they were all locked. That's odd, Marion said. These things don't look like they can be locked from the outside. She knocked on the door a few times, awaiting a response, but none would greet her. You think the crew crawled inside and died? I asked. I don't know. I'm just glad we're in these suits. Dying from an infection isn't how I thought I'd go out. Let's keep going, Jackson ordered. We'll check the lower floors. Someone obviously screwed up when getting the blueprints. We returned to the stairwell, descending another floor, which was marked as the laboratories. Jackson let out a soft scoff as we entered through the door. Once again, we were led into a corridor, but one far wider with glass walls on each side. We shined our lights through the windows, met with a pristine workspace on one side, seemingly untouched. The glass had a singular large A printed on it. As we turned to the second lab, marked B, we found something else entirely. Within stood a massive monolith of what optically resembled ice, but which seemed impervious to melting. At the base, small streaks of the same black substance stretched out towards the furniture within the room, appearing to seek out anything it could latch onto. Cameron attempted to open the doors, which wouldn't budge. What in God's name do you think you're doing? Jackson shouted at him. Are you actively trying to get killed? No, sir, I just... Cameron tried to respond, only to be shut up by the sergeant. That piece of rock is responsible for the disappearance and deaths of everyone that once called this vessel home. Do you really want to go inside and poke the beast? Sorry, he mumbled back. Dr. Teague, this one's all yours, Jackson announced. What do you suggest? I turned to the untouched lab, wondering if it held the equipment necessary to assist me in analyzing the extracted sample. If I could get a closer look, maybe I could figure out what we were dealing with. We entered the clean lab and started digging out whatever equipment they had stored. First, I just needed some glass slides and a microscope, which were both readily provided. I pulled out the sample I extracted from the dead doctor in the medical bay and got to work. In the meantime, The rest of the team stood guard. Most of them were uninterested in what I had to do, but all were accepting that it had become necessary due to the discovery we'd made. How much time do you need? Jackson asked. A few minutes. I just need to look at it. Truth be told, such an analysis would take weeks, if not months, to properly assess. But at that moment, all I needed was a glance to determine if we were dealing with earthly biology or something extraterrestrial. It was an idea I didn't dare speak out loud, but whatever we were about to face, it would be new and horrific. But as it turned out, I only needed a few seconds to recognize the gravity of our situation, because as I looked down at the magnified bit of flesh I'd extracted, a very clear pattern revealed itself. For a moment, I couldn't quite believe it, even though I fully understood what I was looking at. Jesus, I let out softly still struggling to come to terms with the monstrous hybrid before me. What do you see? Jackson asked. Unsure of how to dumb down the information, I fell back on my training, describing everything I saw in the manner I'd learned it. While they might not understand it, my tone of voice would convey the fear I felt. It's a syncytium, continuous cells intertwined with human epithelium, some specks of subcutaneous tissue with venules, arterioles, and nerves, a bit of striated muscle, The foreign syncytium seems to be extending along the nerve ends, pushing itself like small appendages through the adipocytes. It's like it's taking over, using the nervous and vascular system as a scaffold to dig itself deeper. All right, let's pretend I understood the jargon you just blew out, Jackson said. What does this mean for us? It means that whatever pathogen we've encountered, it doesn't just infect us, it converts our tissues. Anyone that gets into contact with those things will turn into something else. Will the suits protect us? Cameron asked, fear rising in his voice. 
I think so, yes. I said. Well, which one is it? I think so, or yes? Jackson chimed in. Yes, we should be safe. There's no evidence of the substance penetrating glass or metal. It appears to exclusively affect biological tissue. First good news I've ever heard coming from you. All right, we keep moving. The generator room is two floors down. We're going to get this place running to make sure the ship doesn't drift onto any Arctic settlements. Last thing we need is the stuff reaching civilization by accident. Follow me. Jackson ordered. I stored the slide inside my briefcase, hiding it within a safety tube to minimize risk of exposure. I then disinfected the working area with bleach before following the rest of the team into the stairwell. So, are we dealing with aliens or what? Burns asked. You're asking the wrong man. Jackson shot back, gesturing towards me. We've got an expert by our side. Maybe, was all I could muster. This thing was found at the bottom of the ocean, right? For all I know, it could be some bizarre form of deep sea oddities. I just know I've never seen anything else like it. We headed down another set of stairs, which served as a storage room. Ignoring it, we proceeded the last few steps down towards the generator room. With the windows long since gone, there was no source of light except for our flashlights, which were barely enough to illuminate the path ahead. Cameron, take point! Jackson ordered. With little hesitation, he got in front of the door, kicked it open and ran inside, sure to check his corners on each side. In the absence of any resistance, we followed him inside. The engines were situated at the back of the room, huge, but obscured by the darkness. From the entrance, we could just barely make out their silhouettes. I let out a sigh of relief, not ready to fight hostiles in the darkness and narrow corridors. Cameron was joined by Burns as the area opened up, both proceeding further inside towards the large engines. But a few feet in front of the machinery, they stopped abruptly, letting out silent gasps of shock. What's wrong? Connolly asked. Guys, say something. Marion joined in. Jackson stood by my side, squinting his eyes at the odd-looking engine before us, which appeared smoother than any piece of machinery had any right to be. What the hell is this? Cameron let out, his voice clearly filled with fear. The rest of us carefully stepped in closer to the engine, our lights fully illuminating the monstrosity before us. There, intertwined with the metal of the engine, sat a blob of flesh completely obstructing all its parts. At a first glance, it carried the same black appearance as the monolith in the laboratory. But as we studied the thing closer, we could clearly make out human body parts sewn into the mixture of the bizarre substance. They formed a singular hybrid between human flesh and the syncytium. These are people, Marion gasped. Guess we found what's left of the recovery room, Cameron explained. How did this happen? Marion asked. Sarge, what do we do? Jackson took a few steps closer, inspecting the hybrid as if expecting to understand it. For the first time since I'd met the man, he appeared speechless. Sarge? Burns half asked, half stated. Maybe it's time to leave. Connolly? Jackson called out. We ain't getting this running, are we? Connolly silently shook his head, too surprised to even speak. But the answer was obvious. The meat was so intertwined with the engine there was no way in hell we'd ever get the ship running again. It almost seemed intentional, as if the hybrid wanted to negate any chance of steering the ship. Then it's time for plan B. Blow this shit to hell, Jackson explained. Connolly, Guerra, get the charges in place. Yes, sir. Marion and Connolly said in sync. They each sought out what appeared to be load-bearing structures of the ship, placing explosives on the walls. Just a few would suffice to sink the ship but we wanted the place to burn to a crisp before it descended into the abyss below. We're leaving this place immediately. Alert HC. Tell them we found no survivors. Jackson instructed. Burns got on the radio, but down in the ship, there was nothing we could do to reach out to our leaders back at the freighter. So we put it on hold until we could get back up on deck. In formation, we returned to the stairwell. We carefully ascended each staircase, communicating mostly through hand gestures. I was the last in line, not trusted to take charge, but competent enough to cover their backs. As we crossed the floor of the living quarters, I noticed something off with a thus far normal hallway. While the doors had all been locked the last time we passed, this time they stood wide open. Something had been there. Sergeant, I said. 
There's something down here. Use your words, Dr. Teague. Describe it to me. Sergeant Jackson shot back. The living quarters. I answered. Someone else is down here. The doors are open. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.